Good morning and happy Father's Day. Welcome to Duck Church. We are so glad that you have chosen to join us for worship this morning. You know, sports are an amazing thing. Someone has described uh, an American football game as 60,000 spectators desperately in need of exercise, observing 22 athletes desperately in need of rest. Well, similar thoughts could be expl uh, applied to soccer or basketball or hockey or other sports, but we know that when it comes to worship, God's desire is that each one of us are participators and not spectators. So as we begin this morning, uh, let me invite you to find your connection card in your bulletin. It looks like this, and if you would take a moment and fill that out, it'll really help us to get to know you a little better and how we might better serve you, uh, pray with you, or pray for you. Please complete as much information as you feel comfortable sharing. And if you're with us for the first time, we're so glad that you're here. And be sure to check that box on the left-hand side that says First Time Guest. Now, over on the back side, there are next steps on your connection card. And since we're celebrating Father's Day today, let me invite you to find a way to honor a father this week. Maybe your own father or uh, maybe your father, like mine, has gone on to glory. Uh, maybe you could find someone who has mentored you or invested in you and just thank them for the positive influence that they have had on your life. Also, talking about positive influence, please pray for our children and our leaders of Vacation Bible School, which is starting tomorrow from 9 until noon and will go through Thursday. In that regard, there is also in your bulletin this little uh, half sheet about Vacation Bible School. And one of the things that we're doing for Vacation Bible School this week is that we are collecting school supplies and snacks for the children in Allander. And uh, we have a, a, a relationship with that congregation and we uh, assist them uh, numerous times during the year. And this is one of those times you're asked to bring in your school supplies and snacks by Tuesday, June the 28th, so that we can make sure that those get delivered to children that need them. So today we're going to be looking at Psalm 8, verse 4. That's going to be our jumping off point, so to speak. And the message is, what men wish women knew about them. Now the great reformer Martin Luther once said, to gather with God's people in united adoration of the Father is as necessary to the Christian life as prayer. So let's express our love for God as we stand and join together in the call to worship which you'll find in your bulletin. Come sing praises to God. Rejoice in His presence for He is our God, a Father to the fatherless and the defender of all who need protection, the one in whom the lonely find a home and the prisoner finds release. Let's worship God together and let's do so by joining our voices in our first hymn, number 144, This Is My Father's World.
Please be seated. The God we worship and serve is our loving Heavenly Father. With confidence in His mercy, let us confess our sin. Would you join me in praying the prayer of confession you'll find in your bulletin? Let us pray. Dear Lord, you are the King of the world, the creator of all things, and the giver of life. You have made us in your image and invited us to be your children, the heirs of your kingdom. And we give you our thanks and praise. We confess that we have sinned and fallen short of what you would have us be. We have found our identity in earthly things like work, money, family, reputation, our homes, our friends, even our country. We have worshiped them more than you. We have turned away from being part of your kingdom work to satisfy our own agendas. We have broken your heart with our sin and we are sorry. Please forgive us. Help us open our hearts to receive the gift of forgiveness that you offer through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Create in us clean hearts and fill us with your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord is like a father to us, compassionate and merciful, filled with endless love. He is not easily angered, nor does he remain angry forever. God doesn't treat us as our sins deserve or punish us as harshly as he could. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so strong is his love toward us. And as far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our sins from us. So be at peace. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven.
Thank you, gentlemen. <clears throat> As we come to our time for prayer this morning, we want to uh, continue to lift up Pastor Amy as she um, continues her chemo treatment. She's coming close to the end of those. And uh, we also want to lift up Jason and their families in our prayers. Uh, also prayers for Kay Ross, whose husband Bill recently died. Um, and we also want to lift up uh, prayers for those that are struggling with COVID. Um, are there others that we should lift in prayer today? Yes. Brad. Brad, thank you. David? Your sister had a baby? Yeah. All right. Well, congratulations. All right. Others? Any others? All right. Well, let's go before the Lord as we pray together this morning. Almighty God of all creation, we join our voices to praise you today, singing of your wonders, giving thanks for your grace and care, and celebrating the joys of life that you have blessed us with, family and friends, new relationships and deeper relationships, new life and transformed lives, reconciliation and restoration. On this day, we are especially grateful for the gifts of fathers, the gifts of being a father and fathers that we miss. We thank you for the many ways that our fathers have shaped us, for their example and their love. Yet we also pray for those who have painful relationships with their fathers, those who are estranged from their fathers and fathers who are estranged from their children. And God, we pray for those who are unwilling or unable to accept the responsibilities of fatherhood. Father, there are also prayers that we lift to you this morning for those that we come praying for this day. Grant them those things that they need. Most of all, give them the gift of your presence in their struggles, that they might be ever mindful of your constant and loving care. Gracious God, all of our prayers are summed up in the longing for your kingdom, that wonderful, amazing, and new reality that is emerging all around us. So we join our voices together, God, praying for the coming of your kingdom, using the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, in honor of Father's Day today, we have a little video for all of our gentlemen, so let's give our attention to the screens.
And friends, it says, rise up, O men of God. Well, we're going to ask the women of God to rise as well as we sing number 576 in our hymnal. As you put your hymnal away, why don't you turn and find someone you don't know and share the peace of Christ with them. Welcome everyone here. Friends, you're nice, nice and seated and comfortable, and now I'm going to ask you to stand back up again. <laughs> We're going to join together in affirming what it is that we believe as disciples of Jesus Christ. The Apostles' Creed is printed there in your bulletin for your convenience. Let's lift our voices together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated friends. <laughs> Thank you. In your bulletin is a little outline and it has the scripture that is going to be uh, the focus of where we begin this morning from Psalm 8 verse 4. Listen for the word of God. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? 
Let us pray. Lord God, as you spoke long ago through the voices of your prophets, speak to us here. Speak to us now through the power of your spirit and the promise of your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Well, there has been, and I suppose always will be, a great battle between men and women. We are clearly unique and often frustrate the opposite sex as much as you sometimes frustrate us. Sometime back, I read that if women were in charge of the world, all men would have to attend the following seminars. And let me preface by saying, these are supposed to be funny, okay? <laughs> so all men would need to uh, attend these seminars. Number one, overcoming stupidity. Number two, parenting. It doesn't end with conception. Number three, Get a life, learning how to cook. Number four, garbage, getting it to the curb. Number five, shopping at the mall without getting lost. And then the one that comes a little too close to home for me, the remote control, overcoming your dependence. <laughs> now it's true that sometimes you may wonder what men do with all of that empty space between their ears. I heard about a man who attended a trade show and he noticed that a merchant had a glass case and behind it were two human brains for sale. One was being sold for $50,000 and the other was being sold for 25 bucks. The man asked the difference in the two and the merchant replied, well, the one which is $50,000 is the man's brain and the one that is 25 is a woman's brain. And the customer laughed and said, well, it figures that a man's brain is worth more, but why is there such a difference in price? And the merchant said, oh, that's easy. The woman's brain has been used. <laughs> I'm giving the men a little time to catch up there. <laughs> Look, all jokes aside, the... The truth of the matter is that God equally loves both women and men, but he has made us with some unique needs. And here are four unique needs that men have. First of all, men need affection. Dr. Gary Chapman, a leading family and marriage therapist, has described in his book, The Five Lang uh, Languages of Love, five unique love languages that men and women utilize in relating to one another. Now, affection is one of those needs that is a great need between men and women. Affection is one of the greatest needs that a person is born with and one that we never outgrow. Affection symbolizes security and comfort and, and approval. When a man has someone in his life who truly loves him and who, is, who will freely express that love to him, it sends a powerful message of affirmation, trust, and commitment. Now, not all, all of us had the privilege of growing up in a loving home. However, I believe that any of us can learn to be more loving. So how do you know which of these five is your predominant love language? Well, here they are. The first is words of affirmation. Some of the best affirmation, uh, the, some of the best affection uh, comes from a steady diet of compliments. Some of us need to improve a bit on learning how to verbally express affection to the significant men in our lives, whether they be uh, one's husband or dad or brother. Now, it has also been suggested that women have greater imagination to be able to tell men how wonderful they are. The second love language is quality time. And quality time means giving someone your full attention. It means looking someone in the eye while talking with them. Now, some of ways of, of doing that are through participating in uh, enjoyable activities together at the same time. It may be 
it may be working in the yard or it may be walking in the neighborhood or it may be traveling, it may be playing a sport or working at a hobby. However it is translated, it means having quality time to interact together. Now in marriage, this is crucial for the long-term health of your relationship. One recent study indicates that the average married couple spends less than one hour per week doing something together. Now, when you consider the fact that there are 168 hours in a week, that is not much time together. Another love language is receiving gifts. And this way of expressing love is understood in the following way. It is providing something that you can hold in your hand and say, this person was thinking of me. This person was remembering me. Now, it may be a gift of something that you purchased, or it may be a gift of something you made, or it may be uh, the gift of yourself, your time and your attention. And then there are physical displays of affection. Some women find the predominant way that they sense affection is my touch. It may be a hug, it may be holding a hand, it may just be uh, an arm around a shoulder. Hugs have all kinds of positive benefits in our lives. Studies show that men cannot get too many hugs. In fact, they did a study, uh, a survey that life insurance companies study, and they found that women who kiss their husbands every day before they go to work, those men have fewer accidents out on the highway. They also discovered that men who kiss their wives the last thing before they go to bed at night tend to live longer than other men, and they found that the same group of men earned more money at their place of employment. So, if you want to avoid an accident, live long, see things pay off, begin and end each day with a kiss. <laughs> Be sensitive to a man's need for physical touching. Reminds me of the story of a boy who was courting a girl and he took her out for a long drive around his farm and he stopped the car where two of his cows were nuzzling one another, licking each other around the lips. And the boy said to the girl, I sure would like to do that. She said, go ahead, they're your cows. <laughs> and then there are acts of service. Another way of saying that is um, actions which express an understanding and willingness to meet legitimate needs. Now, it may be helping around the house. It may be preparing a hot meal. It may be seeing that the house is a warm and inviting place to come to. And while those actions may not appear to suggest affection, in reality, they are ways of communicating that one's per, one perceives needs in that man's life and is willing to see that they're being met. So how, how do we discover our own love language? Well, there are three questions that are asked that make it possible to, to determine your own love language. And those questions are these. What do others do that hurt me the most. The opposite of what hurts you is likely your love language. To clarify it even more, the second question, what do you request most often for others? Because what you request most often may very well be your love language. And then the third question, how do you consistently express love in your most significant relationships? If you answer those three questions, you will likely discover your love language. So men need affection. Secondly, men need encouragement. It is a well-established fact that we are living in a broken down world um, and in many ways it doesn't seem to be getting better. One of the great challenges for men is to be able to remain positive, optimistic, and focused in their role as leaders in their home. One of the greatest ways that you can help your husband or your friend to make a commitment uh, is to make a commitment to be an encouraging person whenever you're together. And the scriptures have a lot to say about the wise use of our speech. There's several here from Proverbs. Look at this, reckless words pierce like a sword, 
but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Or an anxious heart weighs a man down, but a kind word cheers him up. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. And this one, so true. The tongue has the power of life and death. Mark Twain once said, I can live two months on a good compliment. However, most of us need a lot more than that. Because words are like seeds. We plant them into the lives of other people and they bring forth either flowers or weeds, health or disease, joy or sadness. Because this is a broken down world, much of what men hear in the world is not encouraging. They deal with pessimism, anger, threats, insecurity, and frightening words as well. Notice again, Proverbs 12, 25. An anxious heart weighs a man down, but a kind word cheers him up. Does that describe how you relate to the men who are in your life? A salesman had been away from home for an entire week, homesick and worn out. He went to a cafe for some breakfast and the waitress came to take his order and he said, I want two scrambled eggs, coffee, and a kind word. She brought him his eggs and coffee and he said, how about that kind word? She leaned over and said, don't eat them eggs. <laughs> now, why is it important to make this emphasis? Because our words mirror what is in our hearts. Negative words flow out of a negative heart. And a negative attitude may have a devastating effect on a husband. Now the alternate is to plant words of praise and encouragement. Let me give you a little nugget to take home this morning. Everyone loves to be praised. Everyone loves to be praised. William James wrote, the deepest principle in human nature is the craving to be appreciated. Someone else has said, praise does wonders for our hearing. So here are three suggestions on how you can be a greater encourager. First of all, praise specifically. Acknowledge those things that you truly appreciate in your husband Tell him what it is and why you appreciate that quality in his life. Second, praise truthfully. Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 12, 11, the words of the wise are like goads, like firmly embedded nails. When we carefully state positive words of truth in our relationships, we goad or we direct those people in the right direction. Speaking the truth keeps us from stating empty flattery that means nothing. I mean, giving flattery that is pointless and false to a man is like feeding a starving man a steady diet of cotton candy. I mean, it's great at a ball game, it's great at a fair, but you'll die if that's all you've got to live on. Speaking the truth in love feeds a person's soul. It results in assurance, security, worth, and value. It is the compass in the storm that steers him in the right direction. Third, praise generously. Now, before you think that you may ruin your mate with too much praise, remember that we are functioning every day in a broken down world. No Man has to sell himself short because the world will always do that for him. So don't be stingy in expressing praise to one another. Our homes ought to be places where our self-esteem tanks get refilled. It is a description of what a Christian home ought to be. Number three, men need influence. Now look at these Proverbs which speak about influence. Instruct a man and he will be wiser still. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. A wise son heeds his father's instructions. A perverse man stirs up dissension. 
Now, every one of us here is a person of influence. You will have either a positive or a negative influence on others in this life. When we choose to be a person of positive influence, we add value to the lives of others. Whether it is a babysitter who reads to a child or a teacher who inspires a student to love science, or the boss who enables an employee to see their potential and to enlarge their horizon by trusting them with greater areas of responsibility, or parents who instill in their children not only an understanding of what is right and wrong, but also teach them the grace of forgiveness and acceptance. When you do those things, you add value to the lives of others. From time to time, all of us need to be reminded of what is truly important in life. Rabbi Harold Kushner wrote a book uh, entitled, When All You've Ever Wanted Isn't Enough. And he contends that American men have brought, bought into three myths. And those myths are these. Doing something that makes money is more valuable than shaping someone's soul. That's a myth. Working with numbers is more valuable than working with human beings. That's a myth. Working with adults is more valuable than working with children. That is also a myth. Number four, men need purpose. If I were to ask you what the number one goal of your life would, would be, what would your answer be? I think in one way or another, most of us would say that our goal is to be happy. And look, there's nothing wrong with that. The problem is in determining how happiness is found. And most of us look for happiness in one of three ways. We believe happiness is either found in acquiring possessions, pleasure, or power. Solomon, the wisest and most gifted man in the entire Old Testament, tried all three methods. He said, I amass silver and gold for myself and treasures of kings and provinces. He said, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. And finally, he said, I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. Now, most of us would dream of having just one of those fantasies come true in our life, and all three were realities for Solomon. And yet you look at the result of achieving those goals in life. This is what he said. I hated life. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. So is there a better way to live? The answer is yes. The better way is discovering what you were made for and what your purpose in life is to be. And the way that is discovered is through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, the answer is not in becoming religious. The answer is in finding a relationship with Jesus. Every person is created with a God-shaped vacuum in their life, and it remains empty until we come to know Christ as our Savior. There's no other way to come to know God, but through Jesus. In fact, Jesus said this about himself. I am the way, I am the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. You see, friends, at some point in every person's life, he or she has to make a decision about what they're gonna do with the claims of Jesus Christ. The scriptures remind us of a sobering truth. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Men need affection. Men need encouragement. Men need influence. And men need purpose. Amen. Well, in just a moment, we're going to receive the offering this morning. So I'd like everyone, if you will, to... Find your connection card again and consider what your next step will be this week. You know, many people have turned to the convenience of online shopping. Uh, most people send emails rather than letters. Many people read news online and even 
read their Bible and do their daily devotionals online. It really is convenient and helpful. And here at Duck Church, more and more people are giving to the ministry of the church online as well. If you would like help in automating your giving, we're here to help. It's an easy process. Just check that box and someone will be glad to assist you with that. So if you're with us for the first time today, we've got a gift for you. It's a little book called How Good is Good Enough. And it's all about how to know for certain that you'll go to heaven one day. We want you to be certain about that. So all you need to do is drop your completed connection card in the offering plate with your offering when it's passed in just a moment. And then when you leave today, on the back wall on the right side, there's a big table there with a lot of copies of this book. Please pick one up and take it with you. It's our way of saying thank you for worshiping with us today. So as we have been abundantly provided for by a God who loves us, let us give abundantly to the work that God has called us to do as we worship God now through the giving of tithes and offerings. God, we are grateful that you are a loving father to us. You have blessed us with all that we enjoy. And we return these gifts as tokens of gratitude for who you are and for all you've done for us to this very day. May these gifts be used in ways to draw people closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And let's remain standing as we join in singing our closing hymn, which this morning is found on page 710, Faith of Our Fathers.
If you're in town next weekend, be sure to come back next Sunday as we focus on Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 43. And the message will be, it matters who you know. I hope you'll be here. I hope you'll invite a friend to come and worship with you. And now let's receive this blessing. May God, our glorious Father, open the eyes of your heart so that you might see the hope to which he is calling you, the richness of the inheritance he has prepared for you, and the power that is at work among you. Go in the grace of God. Amen.